I just arrived from Amsterdam. It was a little bit of a bumpy ride. So allow me to take a few minutes to settle down and get back my voice, which always suffers from air conditioning. But I hope that you can, I can project it sufficiently to reach all of you here. And also allow me to, to, to sit, given as an academic, I never do that. But nonetheless, I'd like to do it. And it feels like much cozier and family-like. So um, what I'm going to talk uh, about today is actually a sort of a crowdsource talk. And you're going to see what the other people in this adventure, they are uh, my research collective. I should probably say my, it doesn't go very well with collective. But it's a new collective that I had the, the chance of setting up that um, is called Data Active, which takes the name from the project that Mark uh, just mentioned. We are just at the beginning, so I don't have many answers actually. What I have are probably some provocations, some suggestions, and some hypotheses that we would like to test over the next five years. So we have really literally started, we, we are reading, we're getting to know each other, we're trying to understand how to think uh, in bright interdisciplinary and as a collective. So probably this talk reflects also that mathematic creative uh, moment uh, in which uh, we are in. So the title, Big Data, Data Activism and the Global Civil Society is very broad, suggests many possible directions. And I decided to narrow it down and I actually decided that this morning and um, go back to something that um, I had not played with for a long time, meaning the concept of the hegemony and uh, counter uh, hegemony. I'm Italian, so you're all familiar probably with uh, Gramsci, 1920. I'm not a, a Marxist scholar at all, but every now and then when studying uh, social movements and what social movements do with technology, I find the notion of hegemony uh, quite interesting. So I'm gonna try to play these concepts here against those, uh, that dichotomy in a way. I suggest some pos possible uh, directions that this big data revolution might take, or, or might not, given um, we're just probably at the beginning of it. So, um, well, probably in a setting like this, I don't, I don't need really to describe the context, uh, the fact that we live uh, in an in a, in a age of data abundance, the ability of computers, but also of institutions, accordingly to uh, collect and make sense of large, large quantities of data is certainly unprecedented and it is growing very, very fast. It becomes also cheaper, you know, all uh, the numbers, so I'm gonna skip that. It is what someone has called the data, the industrial revolution of data, pointing to the fact that we are probably in front of something that is, um, will change our ways of uh, producing, for sure, but also our ways of being citizens and our ways of relating to each other. Although, mm, I'm a little, always a little bit, bit skeptical um, about these grand narratives, these promises of, uh, you know, revolutions and, um, and big changes. And in fact, I mean, we don't have to, to go very far uh, back in time to uh, find uh, Edward Snowden and the Snowden revelations. And I think that is just one example of the potential shadows that uh, such data revolution might harbor. The shadows uh, concern, of course, uh, you know, surveillance, but massive data collection in general, as it invades um, our um, daily dynamics, changes the way we relate, for example, to the stables, to the industry, changes the way we relate to our means of uh, communication in ways which are certainly positive and interesting and harbor really big promises for social movement and social change, but uh, also uh, might have some negative aspects. Now, um, when I was thinking, so I come from studying uh, social movements and technology. So actually, if I really go back in time, I come from studying alternative media. You might remember that label, which is not very, very popular anymore. I also looked at the internal governance uh, from the very um, beginning, very early on. And uh, back then, we were discussing uh, the digital divide, for example, right? Something that probably are not really discussing that much, certainly not in the internal governance forum, where I actually spend a lot of my time, not only as a scholar, but also, if you want, as an activist. 
So, um, you know, thinking, how can I repurpose myself in the age of, of big data, if you want? I mean, it was in, in view of getting the big grant that, in fact, I ended up getting. So I, um, I decided to approach big data, not much looking at uh, the size of the data. In fact, in this talk, you don't see any definition of what constitutes really big data. But I decided to take big data as, um, you know, as a metaphor for a number of, uh, of trends. And I decided to look at it um, you know, from the point of view of uh, the political attitude that people have towards big data. Attitude meaning not only in terms of perceptions, but also in terms of practices. So what do people do with big data? How do people engage with massive data collection? In fact, I'm not really interested in big data as such, but in massive data collection, except that big data is easier to pitch, right? Um, and I mean, it, it's probably much broader than data collection anyway. So when thinking about data col uh, massive data collection and big data, and what do people do with that at the grassroots level? Well, we see uh, probably something that is captured in this picture. The, the empowerment, uh, you know, the big, the big guy, the <coughs> guy, of course, not, not a woman. I just found this image on the internet. Um, so the, this big green guy uh, probably sees uh, big data as an occasion for, uh, as a new opportunity, as an occasion for fostering social change, whereas the little one into the, the cage might see big data as a source of big uh, control. So with this dichotomy in mind, we go into what I call uh, data activism. And uh, this dichotomy is, is going to inform the entire talk and also is going to be played ag um, against uh, the notion of hegemony and uh, counter-hegemony. So my way of, uh, of describing what I'm looking at, it's, it's a label, right? As academics, we often have to come up with labels. label. This is a, g a general enough label that allows me to fit in a number of different phenomena. At the moment, actually, as a group, we are working on a conceptual paper which has a strong theoretical component and the rest is, uh, is concept development uh, that is going to be ready only probably around the end of May. So this is just the, the broad definition that we started with. So what do we mean by data activism? Well, mobilizations, so social mobilizations that take a critical stance towards massive data collection and big data as a phenomenon more in general. What uh, is interesting, in my, in my opinion, especially if given I spend a lot of time on the ground looking at um, phenomena, for example, hacking, hacktivism, but also alternative media themselves, or media activism, that for many, many years have been really in the hands of small group of, groups of people. Not because these people were particularly nasty, but because it was uh, somehow somewhat of a marginal um, or a niche type of activism. <coughs> So, in a way, what um, I find fascinating with data activism is that, probably because there's uh, quite of a hype around um, big data, probably because software has become widely available that allows a lot of people with no particular skills to crunch data, make sense of them, produce visualization in a fairly easy uh, way. But also, uh, software has enabled a lot of people who want to actually counteract surveillance to act against it in a variety of ways then we see that what was earlier uh, a phenomenon, so engagement, practical engagement with technology, which was a sort of niche activism, is moving towards uh, ordinary users. Now, this is probably uh, wishful thinking, uh, in the sense that I don't see these masses of ordinary users yet, but as I just mentioned at the beginning, uh, we want to look at this phenomenon over five years, so there's still hope for it. Uh, these uh, ordinary users to really pick up data activism. So there is a strong connection uh, uh, with hacker and open source, uh, uh, the open source software movement, for example, but also the media activism of the 90s, but data activism increasingly with ordinary users. Another difference with media activism uh, in, of the 90s is that uh, this, soft, this type of activism is particularly linked with software. So it is in one hand, again, enabled, <coughs> the other hand, constrained by software. By enable, I mean that software allows us to do many things, facilitate, uh, facilitate um, you know, engaging in tasks that probably were just uh, in the skill uh, in the skill set of designers. 
But it also constrains in the sense that we can do probably only what the software wants us to do. And whoever develops the software then has quite some power over it. As we know, I mean, there's a whole uh, world of software development that uh, you know uh, entails anything from proprietary to, to really open source. So uh, the constraint uh, is not necessarily <coughs> an obstacle, or at least I wish it is not uh, to see it that way. So data activism is the lens that we've picked up for um, studying civil society's engagement with massive data collection and big data more in general. So what are we working? What are the concepts that we bring together? Of course, participation, of course, technology, but also resistance, um, appropriation of software and data, and so on. Probably I also should gi uh, give you a sense of where do I come from in terms of disciplines. I do work that is interdisciplinary. I've always done that because I find it uh, more interesting. But uh, if I have to define myself, I'm probably a political sociologist or a political scientist. I don't I very often uh, teach uh, technology related topics or uh, well now, for example, I work in a media studies department. The job I had right before this, I was um, actually teaching um, data science. And the one even before I was uh, working with a lab in Toronto that was studying uh, surveillance and censorship. So I, I bring all of this, uh, you know, kind of um, uh, experience and interest in interests under this umbrella of data activism. And um, what we put together more specifically in terms of disciplines are political sociology and social movement studies, for example, but also science and technology studies, governance studies, critical security studies, and so on. Um, an early conceptualization that I started with is this distinction between two forms of data activism, the reactive data activism and the proactive data activism. It's a rough classification, probably there are some overlaps, but I give you a sense of what I mean. So um, reactive data activism indicates those instances of data activism uh, in which um, activist people um, counteract uh, the, the or resist the practices of massive data uh, collection. For example, encryption is an example of reactive mm, activism. So activists react to an external threat of state or industry or whatever origin. Then there's a second form of data activism, which I call proactive. The proactive, if you want, is more positive, pink side of the story. And uh, it embraces all of the practices of appropriation of data, for example, for advocacy and social change. So how do people, NGOs, uh, grassroots group, appropriate, generate, use, lobby for data, for the availability of data, in view of using this data for, um, for the, the global good, let's say. Now, as I mentioned, um, this talk, but in general, the work that, uh, that we do is crowdsourced. Uh, we are a collective. These are the people that the grant that I got uh, allowed me to, to hire. Um, so I think I should actually mention uh, their name because they, they actually have contributed to this, but in general, they contribute uh, a lot of inspiration uh, throughout um, uh, our daily practices. So we have Jonathan, we have Loneke, Becky, Frederike, Maza, Corinne, Niels, and Kersti. Incidentally, actually, two of these people, two girls, are graduates from the program here. <laughs> so I probably know them. And these are the questions that we deal with when looking at data activism. As you know, when you have these big, uh, big grants, you have to be pretty basic in what you promise. I mean, broad enough, but also basic enough in order to, uh, for it to, to be uh, clear. Uh, to um, the reviewers. So what we came up with uh, are these three uh, very general questions, but we plan to do much more than this. So these are simply um, screenshots from our uh, website. Uh, how do people use big data to foster social change? So this will be the uh, proactive uh, side of data activism. How do citizens resist massive data collection? So the reactive side. And then the sort of, uh, sort of umbrella bigger order question that uh, investigates how does data activism, massive data collection, the availability of big data affect the dynamics of the transnational civil society. And here we are thinking about power dynamics, for example, inequality, engagement, and so on and so forth. 
of the disclosure. This is a finance with a starting ground to the European Research Council. Now, um, you know, it's all like a game of dichotomy here in a way, and it is in fact a bit of a tale of two worlds. On the one hand, uh, you know, the 1984 uh, reference, which actually <coughs> comes from, uh, it's a picture that I took, that's why it's a little, it's a little blurred because I took it with my eye, but I took it at um, one of the Chaos Communication Congresses, I think three years ago, one of the biggest uh, hacker conferences in the world. It was the year, I think it was 2013, the year of the Snowden revelations, in which the Congress, which usually has a theme, they didn't even have a theme, because uh, people say, well, people said, you know, the Snowden revelations, although they didn't surprise us, they really left us speechless. So this was one of the, the big projections on, uh, on, the, on the big um, screen in front of something like 9,000 hackers. And then there's, of course, you know, the, the pink robot, which actually is holding a heart, um, which is the, the proactive side. In, the, 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 in a way, it symbolizes all the, the possibilities that a big data and, and the availability of, of data open up for uh, civil society uh, more in general. So this is a programmatic talk, as I mentioned. Uh, it's more like a series of provocation that uh, would like to get to the point of probably suggesting that we need to rethink our vocabulary when we uh, address, when we discuss big data, especially in relation to development, but also in relation, for example, to the global civil society, which is uh, the, mm, the title of uh, my talk. So a little bit of a theoretical uh, discretion. Um, I refer to Gramsci, but this is uh, digested pretty much. So it's, it's a little bit of a of a shopping list of what is meant by hegemony. Don't, don't expect, in fact, there's only one, uh, the, the name of Gramsci written, Gramsci written in uh, the slides. Don't expect me to quote him uh, precisely. I'm basically mobilizing that discourse in the service of, of what I would like to share with you. So what do I mean by hegemony? Again, shopping here and there. <coughs> From all of those that have been uh, working on the concept. We can identify hegemony as a sort of market-driven politics, as opposed to counter-hegemony that is something else, as we're going to see. We, also, we can also see it as a state-centric organizing of consent uh, to rule uh, relations of, uh, the consent to ruling relation of capitalism. And we are talking about something which is global, but also local, as many um, geographical dimensions as you want, if you want. Every time I mention state in the slides, there is a little asterisk. And the reason is that I'm a little wary of just talking about the state. As we know very well, the state is, doesn't exist in isolation, but especially the state, also when especially we look at massive data collection, cannot do it by itself, usually. So we need uh, you know, um, quite some input from, for example, the industry. So when I refer to the state, is, is that because it is usually uh, what <coughs> the things I refer to uh, use, but for me it's much more complex um, uh, set of players as opposed to just one. Let's say institutions. So it generally refers to the organizing of consent <coughs> to a certain type of relations, which are those, uh, the neoliberal relations, if you want. And it also refers to the reproduction of underlying social structures. And these social structures are both the sort of material cause of the problem, but also the reproduce outcome. So it's a system that perpetuates itself, or at least would like to perpetuate itself. Actually, works very well in perpetuating itself if we look at many of its instances. Now, contrary to hegemony, we can look at counter hegemony. Again, it's an oversimplification, but whereas hegemony was the market-driven policy politics, counter hegemony is transformative politics. Here I actually, more than Gramsci, refer to the work of John uh, Downing, who studied uh, radical media back in the 80s, and that um, built a lot on um, anarchism and the, the, those set of thinkers to look at radical forms of uh, grassroots media. So I was talking about transformative uh, politics. So counter-hegemony is usually subaltern, but I would 
don't want to actually emphasize that part. But it challenges the ideological frameworks. And more importantly, not only challenges, but also substitutes them, supplants them with a set of alternatives. I think it's very important here to, to use the plural. Although actually counter hegemony has in the past been mobilized to indicate a counter hegemony, like just one instead of the plurality of possibilities out there. But we are going to see towards the end of the talk that other people had um, spoken about anti hegemony, and probably in terms of big data, it becomes even more important to, uh, um, to amplify the plurality of the alternatives. Counter hegemony can be seen as a conveyor of change. It builds very much on anarchist prefiguration. So the, the attempt to create here and now the world as we would like it can be the internet as we would like it. And counter hegemony becomes for the group that engage with it actually an ethical statement. So it's not just a set of practices, a, set, a ways of relating to each other, but it's also a message to society. And, and that's why, no matter how small these counter-hegemonic projects, counter-hegemonic instances of data activism are, usually they have a message for society. So they don't try to create an alternative parallel world out there, but they try always to feed back, to connect back, to change society at large. Counter-hegemony is also a way of democratizing state practices. Again, state with the asterisks. I think it's very important when we look at big data and massive data collection to see counter-hegemonic practices as an attempt to democratize state practices. And here I'm thinking about, for example, all the state um, prompted data collection processes, anything from biographical data, but also more recently if we look at the refugee crisis, for example, the attempt to gather data probably to, you know, with a good intention of managing more efficiently the information, but certainly also with intended or unintended consequence of uh, depriving these people of their identity and also of their agency. So repressing them, sending them back, monitoring them so that, you know, they are invisible, invisible boundaries that they cannot cross. So I invite you to take this, this uh, idea of democratizing state practices in mind but thinking about counter hegemonic practices. Now, I think it's always been the case, but um, I guess even more so with contemporary activism and not only data activism, hegemonic and counter hegemonic data politics is actually a continuum. It's, it, yes, it is a dichotomy, but there's much more uh, you know, uh, variations in between the two. There are practices that might be hegemonic and counter-hegemonic at the same time, especially when we look at uh, data. Or there might be practices and actions and processes that might have started intentionally as counter-hegemonic, but that ended up being hegemonic. So um, here goes the invitation to, yes, there are dichotomies, and I'm going to use them as dichotomy, but it's a much more granular process in between. And again, we also should remember that uh, this is not necessarily a matter of the state, the mean guys on the one hand, and the good guys on the other. So the mean guys doing you know, hegemonic stuff, so trying to reproduce the state, blah, 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 and the counter-hegemonic guys uh, engaging in everything good that you can think of. Actually, transnational, but also local civil societies can be placed in this continuum. And again, um, intentions and outcome might differ, but also, in general, it's very difficult to imagine civil society always as good and the state always as bad. So in a way, we can see this continuum as identify intentions within transnational civil society. And society is in the plural, trying to emphasize the fact that as I'm gonna make more explicit towards the end of the talk, we actually have a problem, big problem, when we look at development and when we look at big data in particular. Probably it's the same problem that you find in many other fields, but the problem that we have is that we have a vocabulary and we have an approach which is very Western-centric. Therefore, it's important to remember throughout the process that uh, we are 
in front of a plurality of societies, define and understood in a different way, and that behave differently, and for which different solutions might be uh, found or might be needed. Now, what, how can we think about an anti-hegemonic data politics? How does it look like? As I mentioned, I don't have many, many, you know, um, answers in this respect, but I would like to follow these four threads, if you want, that um, in looking at anti-hegemonic data politics. So data politics here is intended as technical practice in interaction with social political emancipation. So there is a technological dimension, but also um, a, a very social uh, one. Of course, the, the starting point is also uh, is always the social, but then in uh, the SDS, science and technology um, studies tradi in tradition, I very much like to take also the, the technical side, the social technical anyway, in the sense that there is a close connection and the dynamic, uh, that's sort of two-way dynamic between uh, the two. And we're going to look now in what follows uh, um, about four of these uh, dimensions, if you want. New epistemologies, a new us, which refers to actual agency and political actors, new practices, and new vocabulary. And we're going to conclude on uh, the new vocabulary. In doing this, I'm going to mobilize some of the concepts that scholars have mm, used to uh, think about hegemony and anti-hegemony, counter-hegemony, sorry, and then anti at the end. And then I'm going to provide some examples, some snapshots. I'm sorry that um, some of the slides actually are pretty tiny, but uh, don't, 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 don't worry, I'm going to go through all the details, so you don't really need to read them. So new epistemologies. So what does it mean to look at big data from uh, the point of view of data activism, for example? Well, I'm interested in big data as promoting a new epistemology because, I mean, in a way, we, we keep hearing that data are the new fabric, is the new fabric of our society. So it is also pretty much informing our ways of making sense of the world, our ways of knowing the world, our ways of interfacing with the world. So that's what I mean by new epistemology. So uh, with the availability of numbers, uh, of course, as we know very well, metrics and numbers, percentages, whatever, mm. have been there, especially in the development sector since, since ever. But um, what is probably relatively new is that they are widely adopted also by civil society and NGO. And we see a sort of move from, we're going to see it more, more clearly in the section on practices, um, a move from value-based advocacy to number or metrics-based advocacy. So this is probably the symptom. I mean, the picking up of this uh, dimension by civil society as well is the symptom of some sort of new, probably new epistemology or epistemologies emerging as um, <coughs> a reaction to uh, the availability of big data. So um, why is thinking about how data change our way of seeing the world, understanding and making sense of the world important in relation to thinking hegemony and counter-hegemony? Well, um, I'm going to hear uh, uh, mobilize Fraser, Nancy Fraser, who um, very interestingly, and later on, it was not one of her earlier work, but um, later, like actually already 10 years ago, but relatively recently, if you want, um, spoke about uh, the politics of representation. So she says that the, the, we are a, so one of the biggest sources, forms of injustice, is the control over the framing of the political representation. So who is there, what is this person doing, and, and what for? So this uh, definition uh, level becomes very important um, when fighting uh, justice. Uh, injustice, sorry. So she, t she, she ta talks about a uh, state-centric politics of uh, representation, which um, becomes uh, very important in the, in the moment in which it intersects transformative politics. So on the one hand, we have the state that has this power of political representation. And on the other hand, we have the attempt by grassroots group, by civil society, 
to engage in transformative politics of representation as the basis for recognition and redistribution. So if the state has this power of representing, of labeling, for example, then you know, from labeling, from language comes recognition, and from recognition, from the state point of view, comes also possibly redistribution, for example, of state resources. So how do data and big data, and then you know, inter interaction with civil society, change this uh, political uh, representation, this uh, you know, power over the political representation that the state has? I have a couple of ideas here. So um, <coughs> they, they go in a different, in very different direction. As, I'm, as I said, these are mostly like provocations here and there. They're not data here, but we are at the very beginning of our work. So <coughs> as you see, is again the, the, the dichotomy, the tail of two words, uh, the pink robot bringing us the positive, the nice side of the story, and the 1984 Ovalian picture reminding us of the dangers of big data. So, um, you know, in mobilizing data to represent uh, society, data can be used as the sole fruit. But as scholars, we know very well that data can actually tell many stories, as can tell many truths. I mean, like, um, if you look, for example, at uh, the earlier manuals for data visualizations for journalists, Actually, it is very clear, clearly stated. You can more or less mobilize data to say anything you want, right? On the other hand, there's the possibility that the story, the, the pink story, is seeing data as complementary in this effort of political representation of society, in this effort of engaging transformative politics that also take into account the, 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 the representation and labeling exercise. So yeah, data is seen as sort of complementary, backing up a story, making it stronger, making um, you know, uh, evidence uh, more clear, and is a disservice of um, advocacy, for example. Tracking. Tracking as, you know, tracking movements, tracking uh, identities, collecting it all for, uh, you know, in the Orwellian uh, perspective is an imperative and very often an end in itself. So the story ends there. And from you know this 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 also discussion about correlation and causation, what can you use data for? Very often, not only tracking is an imperative, but the data collection is also um, you know mobilized to uh, as the sole again um, you know mechanism to investigate society. Whereas on the on the pink side of the story, we have see tracking and data collection as a means of empowerment, as a means of knowing uh, society better, and as uh, one of the components of a struggle against maldistribution, misrecognition, and misrepresentation. This is again Fraser, if I remember correctly. Now, um, it's very important to remember, again, looking at you know, the, the, the plurality of, um, of aspects and actors and practices that big data trigger, that um, all of these are very much localized. And by localized, I don't mean necessarily a geographical uh, perspective, right? But uh, you know, a matter of community, for example, a matter of political sensibility, and so on, a matter of identities as well. And probably, uh, as uh, you know, uh, one of the first steps into this uh, reappropriating the politics of representation is an awareness raising exercise concerning people's right to know, for example. People right, rights to information, people rights to um, have control of their data and um, get to know how data about themselves is uh, collected and managed. Now, if you look at the sa sad side of the story, the 1984 inspired side of the story, we actually have several examples. They use, for example, biometrics for tracking refugees. I mentioned it earlier as probably several unintended consequences, or very well intended, but probably quite detrimental for the people who are escaping war and hunger. But also there are several examples of how um, uh, institutions have tried to stop sex trafficking by collecting data on victims, actually having the unintended consequence to 
uh, you know, originate stigmatization and uh, isolation, and so further damaging the people that already suffer from sex trafficking. And of course, there's the issue of privacy violation, which happens in a variety of, um, of ways, in a variety of uh, locations, if you want. Just to mention one, it's, uh, you know, there's, there's the pink side of the story of crowdsourced disaster maps, where a number of people uh, contribute to gather information and they maintain the infrastructure so that people who are, I mean, disaster victims can, um, you know, call for help and uh, disaster relief operations are facilitated. Yet the, the, the negative side of the story is the potential privacy violation and the mistakes in the redistribution following a disaster that originates, that follow from the use of crowdsourced disaster maps. And I don't include disaster, uh, crowdsourced disaster maps ne necessarily as a negative example, as I just mentioned. There's a lot of positive that comes from, from that, but it's also important to remember that in the politics of representation, through data, the new epistemology of data, there are also uh, some uh, negative uh, consequences. Now, um, a new us. Mm, I deliberately uh, use this pronoun because I'm very fascinated by issues of collective identity. We're not going to get into that now, but it's one of my fixations. How do people make sense of activism, which is very technical, which is, if you want, fairly dry as opposed to other more pressing issues that you know are out in the world, like climate change and women empowerment and so on and so forth. So um, yeah, I refer here to the issue of actors, but also organizational forms and uh, democratic agency. And again, to mobilize Fraser, I like uh, what she says about um, the parity of participation. As we know with data, that becomes uh, you know, a bit of a wishful thinking in the sense that uh, to be able to use, appropriate, master, leverage data, we have to have skills and we have to have data. But especially skills. And uh, skills are not necessarily available or equally available to everyone in the world, but also in our Western societies. So it's important to mobilize the idea of the parity of participation as one of the starting points of data activism. Or starting point to look at data activism, definitely not a reality that already characterizes data activism. So um, Fraser equals the parity of participation to all affected principles. In governance, we would call it the stakeholders. So the question here becomes what forms and what shared ethical visions can or should counter hegemonic practices take in order to involve all the affected people? And to quote Fraser, one of the ideals uh, to look at is an ethics of solidarity that acknowledges difference. It doesn't try to equalize um, or doesn't um, take um, as a starting point the fact we are all equals because we're not. And probably, if you are in this room, you're more privileged than others just to mention one instance of privilege. So um, in practice, what does it mean uh, to look at this you know, uh, positive versus negative uh, dichotomy? Mm -hmm. Well, um, we're looking at uh, who is the us? By whom is data activism done, if you want? Who engages in, uh, in, active in data activism? It's probably the, the, dis the discriminant here. It's probably what we should. Uh, focus on, meaning like everyone should try to engage or whatever should at least have the possibility to engage. But if the question is on the country, on behalf of whom are we mobilizing data? Well, that's a good answer. That, that's a good question, certainly, is when people want to engage in you know, social change. But uh, it doesn't actually reach fully or it doesn't take advantage fully of the possibilities that uh, data activism offers in that uh, people are not engaging with the data themselves. They're not taking responsibility for, uh, their, um, uh, for, for, for the change in their society. Amongst the, the interesting aspects of, um, of the new us that uh, characterizes data activism is the emergence of new rhizomes. So new connections, new networks of uh, actors that wouldn't otherwise have spoken to each other. For example, hackers, we talk to journalists, and here I'm referring to the network called Hack Hackers, I don't know whether you, you know it, that connects journalists who can tell a story, but do, don't have data skills with hackers, who have data skills, but probably are not as 
as good as uh, the journalist in, uh, in storytelling. So unexpected, powerful alliances, very exciting to see happening, especially for someone like me that's been studying and looking at a variety of movements for a long time. These are things that I could not even dream of a while ago, right? And they are mostly based on the, the, the existence and the need for complementary skills. But also, for example, uh, you know, hackathons being hosted in national parliaments. This is also quite unusual, right? So you see you know, people with hood, hood, uh, hoodies and, and sleeping bags in, in a location that is not naturally seen, those type of people. And uh, one of the, the ideals uh, at the base of these rhizomes, although, again, um, this is probably wishful thinking to a large extent, is the idea of an inclusive culture of communication and engagement something which is inherently participatory, and that derives this participation on the, the sharing of skills and um, desires. The negative side of the story is that probably there are also some creepy alliances. There's a lot of money in data these days. That's good, actually. I mean, for once, someone who wants to invest in some social change, you know, process of some kind. But probably we should be a little more careful uh, in uh, whom do we say yes to? I don't know, I'm just guessing here. I have some creepy alliances in mind. So many others are just you know, uh, very good. So it's not that corporate money necessarily equal uh, negative consequences, but uh, you know, it's, it's, it's correct for to interrogate where the money comes from and what alliances does this money uh, foster or, in, or, or hides. And there is also, of course, the big scale of availability, accessibility, the big problem of the availability, accessibility, and of the skills, the knowledge problem, the knowledge divide that we see uh, there. And uh, one of the, the things that we would like to investigate over the coming um, years is uh, this idea of the new forms of inequality that data actually um, make uh, or create, originate in civil societies. And um, one of my uh, PhD students called it data divide. And it's, uh, you know, it echoes uh, the, the notion of the digital divide, but again, it's a matter of access, a matter of access to infrastructure, if you define infrastructure in a very broad uh, term. And uh, my hypothesis is that actually um, the global civil society is going to suffer from this data revolution. Probably in, in some instances is, is definitely going uh, to win as well. But the fact that you have, I mean, you're going to soon notice, and probably it's already there, a divide between those probably large web resource NGOs that have access to data, that have access to, they can hire people who can crunch data, make sense of data, therefore create campaigns, for example, based on that. Uh, and on the contrary, those probably, just, just a guess, but sensible one, I guess, smaller scale groups who don't have the ability to have um, you know, access to data or the ability of making sense of large quantities of data. So this is what we mean by, uh, digital, uh, by data divide. And we'd like to see whether, uh, whether this is actually the case over the coming few years. I'm very happy to be proven wrong, of course. Then, um, new practices. New practices refer to the actual repertoires, to use a um, sociological uh, term. And uh, here the practices are, uh, well, they can, someone define them as a recuperation of local powers of self-determination. And I think what is important here is local and self-determination, which is not much of an affirmation of a presence in a way like, like the, the, the politics or representation mentioned earlier was, but it's a matter of transformation. And it is um, all the way defined it as the liberation uh, of the power to do something from the power over uh, someone or some specific project. So th the power to the open ups for a variety of different activities, possibly good ones, uh, as distinct from the power over as control over processes and mono 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 monolithic, monopolistic, sorry, <laughs> control over, over resources and processes. Again, Holloway. Uh, we can see it as the struggle for the reassertion of social flow of doing against the fragmentation and denial, which at instead will come from hegemonic practices of the state slash industry complex. Now, what
what uh, what is the difference? I mean, if we look at the practices um, between anti-hegemonic and hegemonic practices, well, anti-hegemonic practices are first person, are hands-on, as opposed to proprietary and centralized. They entail direct action and prefiguration as ethical statements. They are in in inherently emancipatory. And the it's emancipation that comes from the technical the engagement with the technical side as well. They stand for the articulation of counter power. And for example, they originate uh, value-based narratives that are backed up with data, as opposed to, to narratives which are exclusively based on data. Amongst the hegemonic data practices, well, we have, for example, um, data soaking. Meaning, you know, especially if you look at the development sector, a lot of the approaches today, unfortunately, as the sector tries to make sense of data and the possibilities of data and processes all that new information, unfortunately, what we see is pooling of data out of communities and very little giving back to the community. And it's, it's particularly wor worrying uh, because this is already something that is done by, for example, um, you know, electronic communication companies. NGO shouldn't probably contribute to the same type of exercise. Because ultimately, all this is something that perpetuates uh, dependency. And here I wanted to mobilize the dependency theory, but I, I leave it at that because it's quite late already. So quickly moving towards uh, the end. A new vocabulary. So this is more or less uh, an invitation of participating in a collective effort of creating, of thinking, of mobilizing, or articulating a new vocabulary to think about data in relation to development, data in relation to the global civil society. We are in Amsterdam working on a glossary. We are trying to do it. But in the meantime, I just give you some hints, which are for still quite uh, general. Why is it important to mobilize a new vocabulary? Well, we heard what Fraser said about the politics of representation, the exercise of labeling, which becomes recognition, which also has some redistribution or justice um, um, outcomes. The language a new vocabulary is key to prefiguration in the transformative struggle. And but it's also a step towards a sort of dialogic ethic, which is the recognition of the difference and the recognition of the tension in the field. Now, mm, a new vocabulary should start from distinguishing very clearly between information, as in data, though data means much more than that, but which is dif different from communication, but also stating very clearly that connecting is not communicating. Creating connections is very good, but probably it's, it's just one of the steps towards a participatory and dialogic uh, approach to social change. This was actually in um, Say Summerlink's book from last year. How do we rethink voice, for example, w uh, which is uh, when you think about social change and empowerment of local communities, a, a pretty important uh, notion. Well, I actually don't know that yet. I was trying to come up with something earlier today, but I still need to do quite some reading and quite some um, thinking uh, with my group. But it's also very important to think that, say, data soaking is different from data activism. And it's also very important in the effort of creating or thinking a new vocabulary to take in consideration the geographies of data. What do I mean? Well, the geographies of activism, for example, like different groups mobilizing in different places, but again, mostly being in the West where, you know, computers and, and education and data are definitely much more available, but also where we have far less pressing needs than, you know, other people in other um, less uh, fortunate parts of the world. But also, I think it's important to look at uh, the geographies of data as, uh, you know, the, f the flows of the data. And again, dependency theory, if you, if you know what I'm talking about, is probably an interesting way of looking at it. Probably a little outdated, but offers, like techno determinism actually, some hints here and there to understand also the present. So I very much hope that we are not in uh, you know, the beginning of what could be termed data colonialism. At the moment, probably, we are pretty much there. But we still have all the possibilities in front of us to, to change to uh, to change these dynamics of data colonialism. So to conclude, is data the new fabric of anti-hegemony? So counter-hegemony in, um, 
in the literature, it's usually something very homogeneous. It's something that, you know, the notion is that uh, you have, uh, you know, the state industry complex on one hand, sea societies who stand all together nicely, um, counteracting in a fairly monolithic way the other side. Whereas I very much like what Carlo and Ratner wrote about anti-hegemony, as skeptical of attempts to construct a general interest to build unity. It trumpets a politics of dispersed singularities, discounting or even disavowing the need for consensus and coordinated political action. Now, it's not because of data that we can talk about this, of course. I mean, if you also look at the source, it's pretty outdated in terms of thinking this in relation to data. But uh, why not? I would like to see, uh, and that's also because I want to, to conclude on a positive note, I would like to think about data as probably um, a frame, in a way, an extra layer that brings technology closer to the people and brings uh, the hands-on um, engagement with technological practice, forceful to change, closer to the concern of many people that so far consider technology as out of their uh, comfort zone. So why not? Let's play with the idea of data as um, conducive to new, exciting, fun to study and look at and to engage with practices of uh, anti-hegemony. And I guess I'll leave it at that. And sorry, I this spoke very long, but I'm Italian, so <laughs> <laughs> I always forget. Thanks very much. We have, we have a bit of time for questions, so maybe you want to field your own questions, or... Mm, yeah, yeah, why not, yeah. So just raise your hand, maybe you want to take a few at a time, or... Yeah, probably a couple or something. Yeah, I, need a I see Alex wearing to go. <laughs> yeah, it's fine, yeah. Um, yeah, thank you, thank you, it was really interesting. Um, I was wondering about kind of this use of, of hegemony, and I know you say that you kind of, you are kind of taking it from different places, but kind of, you know, just going back a bit, because you do mention Gramsci, like Gramsci's pretty clear in the prison notebooks that, that hegemony is the maintenance of a, of a stable compromise equilibrium, which is kind of maintained through kind of concrete coordination of interests, and he argues that in Western Europe this is done through civil society, and in, in the US it's through, through trade unions. Um, so I guess in neoliberalism, and in kind of what you're talking about, where is the compromise equilibrium? Because he, he kind of, it's quite explicit that without a compromise equilibrium, there can't be hegemony, there can't be common sense. These things rest on, on a compromise equilibrium. Um, and, and also, I guess you're talk, you kind of oppose the state and civil society, but again, Gramsci's talking about, about civil society as creating hegemony, so I don't understand how that fits in, and what, I wonder whether there's actually it is hegemony that you're you're talking about, or is it ideology, or is there other concepts which would be better for, for understanding? What you're trying to Thank you. So <coughs> we were talking about the divides that would come with the use of exp an exploitation of data, mm -hmm. and how do you think this should inform the open government data policies? Uh, in it seems to me that uh, with your framework or the way you're looking at it, uh, the companies will encroach even further into what the little space uh, is still in the public domain uh, or the little space through which citizens can impact since I mean, at least I think of government data as the possibility of rethinking identities and challenging uh, the given identities. Uh, will companies just gain more space and the state will become even smaller or or will the civil society be able to be up to this challenge? So I can talk, these are both very big questions. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm not sure I have an answer. I was actually, uh, to the question on uh, mobilizing Gramsci in a bit of a funny way, I saw it coming <laughs> and I very much hope it wouldn't come. So, uh, in the sense that I, I was aware, I, I mentioned it earlier, I was, I'm aware that I'm mobilizing concepts uh, in the service of my discourse rather than taking uh, certain notions with their historical baggage, right? So, it is um, you know, something that you do in a talk, but you probably don't write up, if you know what I mean. 
Um, about the compromise equilibrium, that was something in particular that was worrying me as I was on the plane to come here. And I don't have an answer. So if I ever decide to write this down, <laughs> probably I will have to, to, to find a solution to this. But thank you for posing the question. It's very also nicely articulated. And um, it's going to give me some more food for thought in the coming hours <laughs> list. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, the civil society is being part of, uh, you know, at the interaction state, civil society, and civil society being part of the equilibrium is something that I see very much looking at governance and multi stakeholder governance, for example, uh, these days. Mm, it doesn't necessarily relate to this, but I do a lot of intern governance work. And um, it, it, it's Gramsci. I mean, it's a it's, it's, it's perfect picture of what he was talking about, transposed to, if you want, a globalized uh, perspective. I don't know exactly how it would translate with uh, data activism. But bear with us. We're going to probably really have a number of answers in the course of um, five years. And actually, I'm afraid that probably the same answer <laughs> goes to your question about uh, the divide, about the state becoming smaller and um, uh, the industry invading certain spaces. Having done also some government work by mistake at some point in my life, um, I actually saw it happening with the implementation of the digital agenda for Europe, which doesn't necessarily relate to, um, to the, the open government um, as such, but it is included. I mean, the open government, open data was one of the various elements. So freeing uh, national data and so on and so forth. And um, what uh, I could see very, I mean, really happening in front of my eyes was that in the lack of um, serious thinking about this or knowledge even, the ba basic understanding of what these entails, like oh, freeing data and open government policy, of open data policies should at least entail, the space was deliberately occupied by the, the private sector, who unfortunately contribute also to, to the framing of the entire question. Not only, you know, like, I probably see no problem or less of a problem in infrastructure being provided by private actors. What is more problematic is when even the framing of the question and of the problems, I mean, the decision as to what problems should be solved and how to do that comes from uh, the private sector. Now, this was, what, five years ago, probably four years ago, so I have some hopes that, uh, you know, we do have quite some good people in government, probably in several governments at least, and that uh, this uh, doesn't happen, at least to that extent. At the same time, it's also an opportunity for civil society, and I also saw that happening. Meaning like, uh, you know, Freedom of Information Acts or something similar. They're called in different ways in different countries. But they um, provide really opportunities for people to not only ask for data, but also when they have to lobby for having access also to de decide on a way or, or provide some, some inputs into the infrastructure, the data infrastructures that are um, are in use by the state. So it is a very fluid, very dynamic uh, process, and um, I'm looking forward to, to explore it in the coming years. And, uh, and yeah, probably, I mean, my hypothesis off the top of my head is that the state might become smaller, but simply because the state less, less, less industry complex is going to become bigger. And I'm not sure that is good in any case. I'm not sure what is best, actually. Um, how would you locate whistleblowing in all of this? Because do you think that it's like a counter force against um, like the increasing control over data of, um, of people? Or because I think it's like an interesting aspect to think about it. It's like using the um, force's own weapon um, against itself in a way, as we see from, for example, the case. Mm -hmm. So um, the way I classified it temporarily to start working this on these things is actually part of the reactive side of data activism. It's less obvious probably in the sense that reactive means uh, openly, you know, having this sort of building barricades against something, if you want. 
But um, I see it as reactive in that it tries to, uh, I mean, I still, there's still a threat, right, which is secrecy, for example. And therefore, people mobilize information uh, accordingly in order to counteract this uh, threat. So I would, I would insert this under the, the reactive classification. But again, reactive versus proactive, it's just a tool that allows us to start looking at these um, dimensions. And uh, probably you're going to have a much more nuanced classification or typology if you want uh, in the coming months. Do we have any final questions, comments, thoughts? Is everyone shy? Please sit in person. <laughs> well, because it's super hot in here. <laughs> Sonnet approach, the knowledge. <laughs> it's both distill. Yeah. It's in the air. Yeah, exactly. I mean? Just a final, maybe a comment and a question. I mean, how much of a thought have you given in terms of role of a state? I, I know you mentioned it in the earlier part of state centric sort of stuff. How much of a thought have you given in terms of role of state? in this aspect of data activism, considering the last comment you made with the state getting smaller. So I think that would tie back to the aspect of hegemony, which Alex was mentioning in, in the first question. Yeah, so the state, so taking at least in this initial framing, the approach of the grassroots perspective if you want, on the politics of big data and on those dynamics, the state is the kind of, for the moment, the black box on the other side. And it is just dictated by an overly simplified research design that tries to anyway emphasize a certain type of sector of activities, yeah. uh, which are the grassroots ones. Uh, clearly, and also especially in, in inter when we start looking, for example, at uh, critical security studies, uh, governance studies more explicitly, but also international relations, the state's going to become much more complex than this. But it is not, at the moment, it is really just a black box. And uh, a, a black box that interacts with another black box, which is the industry. Okay, well, th thanks so much for your talk today. We, Thank we, you. We really appreciate it. I uh, hope, hope the sauna hasn't gotten to you too much. <laughs> so we did.